I do feel that, you know, hearing the voices from an uh, Indigenous woman lens to this issue um, is so important. Tonight, leaders taking a deeper look into the health care system. We're going to see in the upcoming months is the Liberals take any opportunity and any excuse to push for an election. Nunavut's MP is back at work in Ottawa. They tell them about the ceremonies. When children are born, what ceremonies are involved. And elders mentoring mothers using online methods. Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson. The homeless population of Quebec is now exempt from the province-wide 8 p.m. curfew. A Superior Court judge ruled in favor of an injunction order late Tuesday evening. The request for an injunction was filed by legal aid representatives in Montreal on Monday. In her ruling, Judge Chantelle Massé agreed the curfew compromises the safety of the homeless population. News which comes after Raphael André, a 51-year-old Inuman, died near a closed Montreal shelter on January 17th. Several of the city's homeless also received $1,500 fines for being out past 8 p.m. Quebec officials said Wednesday morning they will not contest the ruling. The images of Joyce Essocon as she pleaded for her life, dying in a hospital bed in Quebec, left a permanent mark on many who saw them. And for the next two days, meetings are taking place between federal, provincial and Indigenous leaders to prevent it from happening again. Jamie Pashagumskum reports. Canadians often get frustrated at politicians that simply call things out and then don't do anything afterwards. So I think Canadians will expect concrete answers, concrete measures. It's an all too familiar story with many Indigenous people. You're just not safe in the Canadian healthcare system. The latest example, in Alberta, accusations of an Ojibwe woman's pleas for more oxygen when ignored. Miller was asked in a press conference Wednesday if federal funds could be withheld from provinces who do not address racism in health care. This is not a time to be holding back money as a, um, as, as a threat, particularly during a pandemic. This is a jurisdiction that is jealously guarded by, by provinces. Um, but when it comes to issues like racism, systemic racism, discrimination, every leader in this country has a leadership role to play in calling it out and getting rid of it. Quebec officials, like Indigenous Affairs Minister Ian Lafreniere, have yet to recognize systemic racism exists in their province. But we agree to disagree on the systemic uh, approach. Lorraine Whitman of the Native Women's Association of Canada says incidents like Joyce Eshaquan's where the Atikamek woman live-streamed racist comments from healthcare workers shortly before she died says it all when it comes to systemic racism in the healthcare system. You know, when you see a video and it's already there and you see the systemic racism that's there I'm sorry but in order for anything to be corrected or to be moved forward you first have to admit there is a problem and we know there's a problem. Whitman says Native women need to be front and center over the next two days of meetings and is dismayed that her allotment to speak is only five minutes. Yeah. So I do feel that you know hearing the voices from an uh, indigenous woman lens to this issue um, is so important that the women's voices be heard. Many agree that doing nothing with regards to systemic racism will have fatal consequences. Jimmy Pashagumska, APTN National News, Ottawa. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller not mincing words when he was asked for his opinion on the BC couple who jumped the queue and flew to the Yukon to be vaccinated. That, uh, that was the most idiotic thing I've seen in, in weeks. I understand these people are wealthy and I, I won't tell them what to do with their money, but, um, you know, perhaps reparations are due in, of some level. Rod Baker resigned as CEO of Great Canadian Gaming after news broke that he and his wife, Ekaterina Baker, flew into the territory to receive doses of the Moderna vaccine. Both were fined just over $1,000. The province of Saskatchewan announced they will end the birth, the, the practice of birth alerts starting February 1st. 
Healthcare workers and social workers have been able to flag expectant mothers as addicts, and once the baby was born, the infant would be seized by the government and put into provincial care. Last year, 76 birth alerts were brought to the attention of the province. Out of those 76, 56 were Indigenous women. The Saskatchewan government wrote to APTN that the decision to stop birth alerts is based on the recommendations of the MMIWG inquiry and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And we want to hear what you think about Saskatchewan being the latest province to end the practice of birth alerts. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. The investigation of the 2020 RCMP shooting death of Rodney Levi is finished. The RCMP officer will not face homicide charges in the death of the 48-year-old Mi'kmaq man. New Brunswick prosecutors have released a detailed report that sheds light on what happened. According to a witness statement by a relative of Levi, he was suicidal and talked about suicide by RCMP. That is part of a 16-page review from the New Brunswick Office of the Attorney General that ultimately found the shooting justified. According to six witnesses and the two RCMP officers, Levi of Metapenagia First Nation was a, at a barbecue when he became distressed and grabbed two large kitchen knives. Police were called and unsuccessfully tasered Levi, who was then fatally shot after he approached one officer. A witness recording of the events confirmed the statements. To Alberta now, where a new RCMP detachment has opened on Stony Nakoda First Nation. CTV's Stephanie Thomas has more. One of 10 new full-time RCMP officers pulls up to the satellite office off the Trans-Canada Highway at Shinnecke Lake Road. The staffing levels to the region were increased earlier this month. By ha us having our full-time members out here, we're, we're better serving the community, we're reducing our response times, we're better integrating with the resources that are out here. The Chiniki Nation, one of three nations that comprise the Stony Nakoda Nation, renovated 1,000 square feet of this building for the RCMP to avoid a long drive to the Cochrane Detachment. The CEO for the Chiniki First Nation says the community called for more officers in response to a drug crisis on reserve with opioids and meth. And unfortunately, we're having people who overdose, uh, don't understand what some of the um, cocktail would be, be made up of uh, in the drug uh, of choice. He says the increased police presence is intended to connect with the community and increase safety. Enforcement should be the last of the responses that the police should have. The interim commander says the RCMP posted to the area are committed to reconciliation as discussions about a yeah. permanent building are underway. I think the community wants us out here and we want to be out here more and then this shows our commitment to that. The Chiefs and Council, Stony Tribal Administration and RCMP are meeting regularly to discuss plans for a brick and mortar detachment. The location and cost of construction have not yet been determined, but further details are expected to come sometime in 2021. Stephanie Thomas, CTV News, Stony Nakoda, First Nation. Time now for our first break. Coming up, we sit down with Nunavut's MP to hear more about what prompted her to take a break from the job last year. All those comments where people were saying, she looks sick, she looks on, yeah, I just did three weeks of really intense housing tour into like every home I went into had moldy homes. Residential school defender Lynn Bayak announced her immediate retirement from the Senate earlier this week. Today, Senator Murray Sinclair says her departure is, quote, a positive event for the Senate and Canadians. 
Sinclair said he believes in offering people an opportunity to learn and change, but doesn't feel Bayak did learn, as her resignation statement said there were, quote, good aspects of residential schools. Senator Sinclair went on to say, clearly she was hiding her true thoughts and feelings all along. This suggests to me that she is not only continuing to be unwilling to learn, but that she will continue to espouse her racist views going forward. Her attitude is harmful and dangerous, and I'm glad that she will no longer be able to express those views in Parliament. At the end of 2020, Nunavut NDP MP Mumila Kakak took two months off to deal with depression and burnout. Now she's back to work in Ottawa, and our Kent Driscoll asked her how she's doing and where she goes from here. This is Nunavut MP Mumila Kakak after she had finished a three-week tour of Nunavut's terrible housing conditions. She says that trip and the desperation she saw were big factors in her taking two months off to improve and plan for her mental health. Like all those comments where people were saying, she looks sick, she looks on, yeah, I just did three weeks of really intense housing tour into like every home I went into had moldy homes uh, and I work really hard. Most days I was working until about 11.30 at night. With Parliament resuming, she's back to work, rested, and with a plan for her mental health. I understand the hard work that I need to do in terms of counselling and whatever mental health looks like to me. Um, and I know, you know, coming back, I definitely feel much more rested and my head's back on and I, uh, I, I get where I'm, I feel grounded again. When she took that tour, she didn't jump through the usual territorial hoops. She didn't loop in the government of Nunavut or the housing associations. She went to see things firsthand. And that caused some backlash from the establishment. Kakak explains. I think because a lot of people were quite, like, to put it bluntly, very angry with me for not following GN process and procedure. I don't work for the GN. I don't work for the housing corporation. I don't work for NTI. I work for the constituents. I have no obligation to go through any proper policy and procedure. With Parliament underway, the Prime Minister will be trying to keep his minority government alive. Or he'll call an election to try for a majority. Kakak thinks it's option two. Unfortunately, what we are going to see in the upcoming months is the Liberals take any opportunity and any excuse to push for an election and they're going to take any opportunity they can to make it look like it's not their fault. So I just want to put that on everybody's radar. I bet here upcoming something is going to happen and the Liberals are going to make it look like it's somebody else's fault, but they are gunning for an election and we do not need that. Not in COVID, not when the economy is in the toilet, and not when people need vaccines and help right now. We asked Kakak, right after she finished the tour that burned her out, if she was going to run for the seat again. She wasn't sure then. She isn't sure now. But she is leaning in a different direction after her break. I definitely feel very much in a better spot, and those discussions are definitely, they're leaning a lot more to yes, um, but they're still not 100% at all. Kakak is unique as the new Nunavut MP for many reasons. She's the first NDP member to hold the job. She's the youngest person to hold the job. And now she's showing Nunavut Mute that mental health is health. Kent Driscoll, EPTN National News, Akawit. We'll have more from that interview on tomorrow's newscast. Coming up after the break, a program in Alberta is teaming up expectant mothers with elders for traditional teachings. I would also speak to them in Cree because they don't have the frame of reference to raise children traditionally. That's been lost. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Today's photo comes to us from our very own video journalist, Lee Wilson. This amazing shot of an eagle was taken in Terrace, BC, along the Sheena River. Thanks for that, Lee. Send us what you got. Email your shot to share at aptn.ca, and we'll do our best to get them on the air. 
Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Here is tomorrow's weather forecast beginning on the east coast. One above in Halifax, minus three in Charlottetown. Minus eight in snow in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus 10 in Maine. Minus 10 in Montreal with some snow. Minus nine in Quebec City. A little bit of sun and cloud and minus 11 in Peterborough. Four below in Windsor. Minus 22 in sunny skies in Big Trout Lake. 19 below in Sioux Lookout in northern Manitoba. Sunny skies and minus 25 in Churchill. Minus 17 in Norway House. 16 below in Barron's River and Princess Harbor in Saskatchewan. Minus 3 in some sun in Swift Current. Minus 16 in Yorkton. 18 below in La Ronge. Minus 20 in snow in Stony Rapids. In northern Alberta, 20 below in Peace River, 18 below in Grand Prairie, a minus 14 with some sun in Red Deer, minus 8 in Medicine Hat, over to the west coast, 2 above in Kamloops and Penticton, minus 11 with sunny skies in Smithers, minus 11 in Prince George, in the Yukon, a chilly minus 30 in Mayo, minus 31 in Old Crow, over to the NWT, some sunny skies and minus 30 in Wrigley, 27 below in Fort Simpson. Minus 33 in sun in Colville Lake, minus 30 in Inuvik. In Nunavut, minus 20 in Chesterfield with some snow, the same in Will Cove. Minus 16 in sunny skies in King Knight, and minus 24 in Clyde River. A program where elders help young families in Alberta's Muscatchie's community had to stop because of the pandemic. Now it's back up and running, but what was once a person-to-person -person experience is now being done by phone and online. Chris Stewart has the details. Muriel Lee has been helping expecting parents since the Muscatchie's Elders Mentoring Program began in 2015. She is one of several elders sharing the wisdom they have gained from life experience as a mother and grandmother and teachings from the elders and family who taught her. Now she is helping teach new and expectant families what to expect when a baby arrives and changes everything. Muriel Lee uses language to impart her wisdom. I would also speak to them in Cree because they don't have the frame of reference to raise children traditionally. That's been lost. So I speak to them because I believe how powerful the, uh, my language is. My language is spiritually based. I use my language. I use what I've been taught to speak to them. Before COVID, the elders would meet the families one-on-one -on -one and go to clinics for prenatal visits. COVID put a stop to that. But now they are set up to help again via the phone and Zoom. Muriel says it's important to teach the traditional ways that she was taught. We tell them about the ceremonies. When children are born, what ceremonies are involved in order for the ceremony and that natural world to have a part in that child's life so that child will have strength. It's not always easy to be a mentor. She also hears from parents who have lost their children through miscarriage. It can take a toll. I consider myself a tough old woman, but um, when I spoke to these women, I was glad I was not on Zoom because I had to cry a few times while I was uh, talking to them. Um, it was very healing. And she is hoping to once again meet families in person when the pandemic is over. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Why are non-Indigenous people claiming Indigenous identity? 
Identity fraud was a discussion today on In Focus. The reasons why some might claim an identity that's not theirs and the consequences to Indigenous communities. My cousin, Phil, uh, Phil Deloria, he wrote a book called Playing Indian in which he documented the historical um, sort of use of playing Indian. Here in, the, here in the States, you know, of course, they dressed up like Mohawks when they did the tea party and threw the tea into the, you know, starting the Revolutionary War. But it's persisted and it is even more, it really is another form of carroting almost, I would say. And, um, and it's, I think that white people are so accustomed, they're centered by white supremacy to such an extent that they feel no compunction about doing this. And, and I think that um, there's a level maybe even which they, they covet what we have and they feel we don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. And so they decide they can perform the identity better than we can, and they can for a white audience. White people like to, there, there was a study done in 2017 by Reclaiming Native Truth and what they found was in these focus groups that white people, first of all, 30% think they are of native descent. 30, that's 50 million people in the United States, right? Yeah. How many are gonna check the box? How many are going to you know, go full you know, live action role play? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and so we have a sitting senator who did that, Elizabeth Warren, right? Right. And, and Harvard trotted her out when they had accusations of, of lack of uh, representation of women of color at Harvard in the 1990s. You know, and, and so it's um, I think that white people like to see what they found was white people like to see other white people in red face. It yeah. makes them feel really good. It reinforces their in-group cohesion. It, it raises their self-esteem. So we're fighting something in which and they also found that only 30 percent of white people understood the mascot issue, which is another which is, I think, on the spectrum of this performance of ethnicity. Um, huge bumping completion rates that occurred in 2011 on the East Coast for self-identified Mi'kmaq individuals. Um, I had wondered when I was looking at it, what happened between 2006 and 2011, and then again to 2016, why did indigenous people close the post-secondary education gap? And it happened to be because everyone was self-identifying in 2011 in the census um, because of the establishment of the uh, Halapu landless uh, Mi'kmaq community. Mm. Uh, over well over a hundred thousand people all of a sudden became indigenous overnight and uh, it was uh, quite a mess at INAC because I was there at the time and um, all this leads to very distorted uh, statistics which undermine the effectiveness of public policy that targets say health inequities and education outcomes so for instance, you might start believing now in the East Coast that there is no gap between outcomes in education, that mm -hmm. all of a sudden, Indigenous people down on the East Coast are uh, on equal terms. But again, it's a lot of white, non-Indigenous people who are now claiming to be Indigenous, who never had to face sort of the dis, uh, disadvantages and discrimination of being Indigenous mm -hmm. and all the barriers that was to completion. So you would see that also uh, likely play out in, say, health statistics and other socioeconomic outcomes. If you missed today's episode of In Focus, you can find it online on our Facebook page at APTN News. That's all your APTN national news for this Wednesday, January 27th. Find more Indigenous news on the APTN News app and online at aptnnews.ca. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a great evening.